Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. The law specifically forbid it. No one except doctors were allowed to dissect corpses. The act was considered a desecration of the dead. Therefore, only the bodies of criminals were permitted to be studied. And once analyzed, even they had to receive a decent burial. He wasn't a doctor, though, so he took to dissecting bodies in secrecy. Well, in relative secrecy. He was just 17 at the time, and the majority of the cadavers he worked with came from the monastery of Santa Spirito in Florence, Italy, and with the full permission of the Catholic Church. He had always been interested in the human form. When he was just 13, he studied under a famous sculptor, and by the time he reached adulthood, his talent for documenting the intricacies of the human form had not gone unnoticed. Back then, doctors and medical students relied on such drawings— importance was given to the understanding of how bones and muscles lie under the skin. When he was just 15, he showed so much potential that the statesman known as Lorenzo de' Medici, a.k.a. Lorenzo the Magnificent, became quite impressed with the young man's talent and incredible understanding of the human form. Not only did Medici take him in and raise him alongside his own children, who became his childhood friends, the statesman also granted him a special room to continue his dissections. Soon, he joined the Florentine Center for Humanism. Like many young and aspirational students in the field, he pored over drawings, sculptures, and skeletons. The ultimate goal was scientific naturalism, the highly detailed and accurate portrayal of the subject in a natural setting. After the death of his mentor, Lorenzo de' Medici, he offered to create a large wooden cross, complete with a life-size sculpture of Christ, in exchange for the new statesman's permission to continue his studies, and to obtain more corpses. And it worked. Now, since cadavers were prone to decomposition, he would quickly make molds of muscles in various positions for later reference. He spent years dissecting countless human corpses, and even those of animals, mostly horses, though. Cardinals and other leaders frequently remarked that experienced and trained physicians and scholars themselves knew less about the human physique than this young man, and that he dissected more than many had in a lifetime of service. His knowledge and talent caused some jealousy among even the most revered of his peers. They didn't always agree, and they often clashed when they met. For years, he drew his discoveries with the most striking detail. But later, he began to doubt his abilities and destroyed most of his drawings. His rivals may have played down his talents, but others did not. Unlike most artists, he achieved recognition and fame well within his own lifetime. Today, thousands flock to see his works. You see, he wasn't a physician or even a philosopher. And while he did create intricate and detailed illustrations for medical use, he wasn't even an anatomist. No, he was an artist, and one of the best. Later, Pope Julius II commissioned him, the artist that we've come to know today as Michelangelo, for one of his most famous works, the Sistine Chapel. The chapel ceiling is his most famous painting, and the marble statue David his most famous statue. The depiction of God creating Adam perfectly illustrates the human brain. Other panels also demonstrate Michelangelo's vast knowledge of human anatomy. The statue of David took Michelangelo two years to complete. Its fine anatomical details impressed city leaders who decided David should reside in front of the Palazzo Vecchio, where everyone could see the breathtaking statue up close, instead of seeing it high on a cathedral ledge. And Michelangelo's envious rival? The first Renaissance man himself, Leonardo da Vinci. Yes, he also dissected cadavers for the sake of art. And while the two men didn't agree on many things, they both believed that when it came to portraying the human body, art is not only better when it imitates life, but also death.
America loves to celebrate firsts. The first president, the first telephone call, the first time Edison turned on a light bulb. Charting new territories and performing feats no one has done before especially intrigues us, and often it's these tales of adventure that have the most incredible journeys to take us on. For example, on July 16th of 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first person to walk on the moon. Before spacecraft, though, we were celebrating airplanes. On May 20th of 1927, Charles Lindbergh was the first person to cross the Atlantic solo. And before that, well, there's another amazing story to tell. On April 13th of 1844, the New York Sun reported the sensational adventure of several men and their balloon trip from England to the United States. The headlines that day read, Astounding News, by Express via Norfolk, the Atlantic crossed in three days. As you might imagine, crossing the Atlantic in such a short time was nothing less than astounding. Accompanying the detailed 5,000-word article was an illustration of the balloon, named the Victoria. At the helm was the inventor of the first steam-powered airship and famed aeronaut himself, Thomas Monk Mason. Two crewmen and five of Mason's friends helped steer the craft, while author Harrison Ainsworth chronicled the journey. The article listed 11.07 a.m. as the moment the balloon left the ground in North Wales. They'd gathered at daybreak, but waited until a dense fog had lifted. For a few moments, the crew held their breath as the balloon cleared the cliffs. Found the ascent force greater than we had expected, the journal read. The gorges and cliffs along the ocean's edge had been nothing short of romantic and breathtaking. One of the crewmen noted that the mountains they'd passed over in the south looked small in comparison to when traveling through them on the ground. Once at sea, the crew lowered the balloon. Along the way, they passed over a few ships sailing below, and the men took to cheering them and yelling as the balloon flew past. By night, the winds had increased, pushing the balloon even faster. The wind, along with the night air and the atmosphere, made the men rather cold, and they wrapped themselves in blankets. The next day, though, the balloon shifted more northward than anticipated, and the wind had died down a bit. This morning, we had again some little trouble with the rod of the propeller, which must be entirely remodeled for fear of serious accident, the journal stated. The wind has been blowing steadily and strongly from the northeast all day, and so far fortune seems bent upon favoring us. By night, though, the sea oddly appeared to glow by the light of the moon and stars. By the third day, though, the crew was exhausted. Around 1 p.m. that day, they finally spotted land off the coast of South Carolina and were overjoyed. By the time they touched down on Sullivan's Island in Charleston County, the wind had nearly died down. The final entry read, We have crossed the Atlantic, fairly and easily crossed it in a balloon. Who shall say that anything is impossible hereafter? And readers were enthralled. People instantly scrambled to buy the paper, and the Sun sold an impressive 50,000 copies. Everyone wanted to have a keepsake of history in the making. There was one small problem, though. Two days after it had been printed, the newspaper revealed that the whole thing had been a hoax. You see, the first balloon to cross the Atlantic wouldn't happen for another 144 years, when the Double Eagle II made the trip in 1978, in a little less than six days. Though the men in the New York Sun story really did exist, they'd been in on the hoax from the start. And the whole thing had been created and written by one author, a man who the paper didn't pay a single cent, despite the tremendous profit they earned from it. That author's name? A struggling writer named Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, and there's more. You see, curiously, Poe's great hoax went on to inspire another great storyteller, by the name of Jules Verne. He would write his beloved novel Around the World in 80 Days in 1872. Although, despite the modern film version, his original never had a balloon. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.